Welcome uh, everyone again to uh, 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 a very special uh, uh, evening lecture uh, by Philip Nelson from uh, Google, Google Accelerated Science. Uh, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce him uh, uh, to, to our evening lecture series. He gave uh, several great talks uh, at MIT and, and in our summer course already. Uh, in our ultra specialized uh, world, uh, we have scientists who focus on uh, subunit alpha of a particular protein uh, in um, layer four of pyramidal cells in mice only on Tuesday mornings. Uh, in stark contrast to that, uh, mm -hmm. Philip Nelson is a true <laughs> Renaissance uh, man. Uh, he started, uh, I think, he started uh, sometime at MIT. Uh, he worked on, on hip prosthetic devices, uh, working with people at the Harvard Medical School. Then he went on to shed light on problems in uh, optimization, on genome sequence, and I don't know how many other uh, <laughs> amazing things. There are very few people in this world that can uh, that are so amazing that they can touch upon a wide diversity of uh, topics. This uh, breath does not come at the expense of death. At the same time, he's uh, extremely deep, as uh, he will dis uh, as you will see from the um, discussions uh, today. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to foreshadow a lot of the amazing things that he will talk about, but one of the surprises to many people in the in the last uh, several years is uh, how uh, one can apply these uh, uh, ideas from uh, deep learning to a, uh, an, an enormous range of problems, uh, from discovering new planets to uh, trying to predict how disease from pictures of the eye and and all sorts of uh, other things so uh, it's really uh, uh, an, an, ex an explosion of, of, of different ideas that has been uh, championed by uh, Philip Nelson and his team and I'd like to encourage people again to to, to ask questions and to, to interact with him uh, 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 both now as well as during the reception that we'll have afterwards uh, in the swap uh, terrace right after the talk so without further ado thanks again for coming and uh, look forward thank to your you. talk Thank you for your two kind introductions. So uh, as an MIT undergrad, it is such a thrill to be here, I got to tell you. So, um, so uh, you know, this talk, it's, I know, realize it's Friday at 8 o'clock. Th this might be sort of like the warm down lap, the cool down lap after a, after a tough week. I'm going to try to stay like very sort of practical and very big picture about what we're doing. I'm going to reference a lot of links, a lot of work. So if you go to that link up there, there's a document with everything referenced. So don't worry about taking notes. Um, uh, all, all the links and the articles and like much more deeper info, info is there. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is I'm going to talk a little bit about my team and and what we do and the you know ridiculously fun mission we have. Uh, how many people just by hands uh, are like very familiar with deep learning? Okay, so about two thirds. So I'm going to do a sort of a fairly quick overview. I, um, I think it's sort of interesting to even when you know something to hear what people choose to talk about, and what they don't talk about. So maybe my editing of this talk will, will give you some information. Um, I'm going to just go through some quick consumer examples and, and sort of tell you why I think they're interesting. I'm going to do a slightly deeper dive on uh, some work that we've done in medical image and microscopy. And then based on time, I'm going to give you a survey of a, a variety of other science projects. And kind of what I'm hoping to do, uh, I'm hoping what you get out of this is a lot of the lessons learned along the way. And um, you know, uh, in theory, this stuff is amazing. In practice, it's often harder. And hopefully, we'll go through that. So that's kind of what I'm going to cover. I'll try to stick within time. I notoriously go late, but we'll, we'll see. So uh, a bit about my team. Um, my job is just ridiculously fun. So we have access to all of Google's technologies, and our job is to go out and solve hard science problems. And so we started as a very small group, almost like uh, just an experiment. And um, we've had a couple of really interesting breakthroughs. So now they give me r more resources, which is fun. And you know, people, it's like, like with, with such a wide open purview, uh, you know, the selection criteria becomes difficult. And essentially, the key to understanding what we're doing is, is impact. We want to change the world. We don't just want to write papers, though writing papers is critical for getting there. We want, we want to actually like, change the way things are done. And hopefully, you'll see that in some of our projects. Um, so we work with a lot of people. We actually, you know, I don't know if any of you have dealt with Google, but it's sometimes hard to do business with big companies. And I've sort of carved out this island, so it's fairly easy for us to, to do deals and all that. And again, one of the practical things you have to think about um, as you sort of start building out this technology. Um, Google is very focused on, on education, especially for the students in the room around internships and AI residency. And I strongly, strongly encourage you to apply to come look at th This info is all in the, the document I linked. But we had 
for 35 or so scientists. I think we had a dozen interns this summer, and I think we'll get even more next summer. So if you're interested in applying machine learning in a sort of scientific or healthcare context, please uh, reach out to us. That's my last sales pitch for, for the night. So. Um, so uh, this is called a Mars Law. Bill Gates repeated it. I think it's actually um, very telling. So you know we're in this hype cycle, and if there's there's pictures you see of the hype cycle where everyone's overexcited, and then there's this trough of disappointment, and then sort of things pick up again. And we've been through this before. But if you look back, you know the the 80s were about the PC, and the 90s were about the internet, and 2000s were about mobile. Like AI, machine learning is is the technology of the decade. And you know this is just you know Pope Benedict in 2000. 2005 and Pope Francis in 2013, you know, it's a different world. You can argue about good and bad, but we definitely live in a different world. And AI is, is going to usher in a very different world, too. Um, this is another quote. It turns out that I, I, I put this up, and someone from Caltech said, there's a terrible story about this person. You should not mention him by name. He it was a bad, bad story. But anyway, the, 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 the quote is accurately, you, people give Yogi Berra credit for this quote, but it's actually him. That essentially, um, you know, there's no difference, uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And a lot of this talk, I'm going to sort of weave in the practical lessons that we learned. So, so, you know, why now? What happened? And again, apologies if this is sort of review. So, um, you know, the, the traditional way of writing code was you wrote rules. You wrote lots and lots of rules. And, you know, um, Doug Lanott and the Psych Project was writing lots and lots of rules. And eventually these systems just fall over. It's very hard to write the rules. The rules start counteracting each other. And so machine learning has been around for quite a while. And the basic idea is more like, can you somehow like turn your data into a vector? And then, if you know, at least for supervised learnings, if the you know, if the credit card fraud of all you know, can you basically you know, you get when credit card fraud happens, you don't find out for three months. The person has to get the bill, they have to complain, they have to adjudicate it. You'd like to predict the fraud right when the transaction's happening. So you get labels on the on the, what was fraudulent in the past. You try to learn formulas on the features of the data, and it worked reasonably well. And you know, year after year, there was thousands of papers. There was PhDs given year after year about slightly incremental improvements in. You know, it's one thing to maybe do features on a credit card. It's actually not that easy. But how do you do features on an image? So there was histogram of gradients, and there was all of these innovations, support vector machines. Really, really fascinating work, and we were making pretty good incremental progress. But it turned out, you know, the the classifiers at the end, the learning, the formulas. You know, you just try them all. There's a lot of different techniques. Just try them all, whichever one works. The challenge in general was turning your data into features. How do you describe the data in, in a way that um, the computers can work on it? And like this is just a great example. I mean, how would you do features for this? You know, yeah, you can start, but you're, you're not going to get very far. So. So deep learning, you know, um, uh, neural nets have been around for a while, and Minsky from MIT famously wrote about the mathematical limits of what, like, the perceptron architecture could learn. But a, a few people sort of kept at it, Jan LeCun, Jeff Hinton, a bunch of people sort of kept at it. And about 10 years ago, there was kind of a set of breakthroughs in deep learning. And part of it was in the, the network architecture, a lot of it was in the mathematics of training. And quite frankly, a lot of it was just in the scale. You just, the networks don't learn for a while, for a, quite a long time. And then they start learning, and they learn, you know, in many cases, amazingly well. And so um, we just needed the new generation of hardware. And two things that are going to come up again and again, and I'll keep pointing to about some of the powerful things that deep learning can do is one is that it can learn the features directly from the raw data. So even if you think you knew what the features are, if you give deep learning enough examples, it, it has often surprised us, and I'll show you a bunch of cases of this, with the features that it found. The other thing is that it's able to make end-to-end -end predictions. So uh, Google, there's a blog post out from Google about a system called Paratron, which basically goes from speech directly to a, you know, speech in a different language or in a different voice. And you, know, you can imagine doing automatic speech recognition. You, know, you go speech to text. Maybe you can translate the text and then reconstruct the speech. But you've lost tone of voice. And there isn't really a good ontology or a good representation for tone of voice. It, you know, it gets lost in transit. But if you could go directly from one to the other, these, these networks seem to be able to model all of these intermediate states. So, and again, both of these things will come up again and again. So, so here's a quick uh, visualization. That, that grid on the lower right is um, the actual, what, what you're looking at is um, for a layer in the network. 
what input stimulus will maximally light up a node. And these things were learned. You know, the network started out random. This, in this case, this network was trained, I think, on faces to recognize faces. And you know, those are not lines that an engineer would draw. But you know, you know, but but what's interesting is you know people have taken retinas out and bathed them in oxygenated fluid and sort of electrically measured them and put pictures in front of the retinas and this is what they believe the the, the neurons behind the photoreceptors are actually doing that they're you know detecting lines and if you, you know if you if you have a baby and you put the sharp black and white contrast things in their crib that you're like told to do it comes from the research that did this so. Again, the networks just learn that by itself. And in higher layers, it learns corners and edges and eyeballs, and it learns all these features on its own. So just a bit about why now, you know, flight had to wait. I think da Vinci knew how to fly. Um, but until we had the con internal combustion engine, we couldn't really fly. And you know, it, the hardware has mattered too. You know, it started with CPUs, then you know, GPUs came out, and now there's this whole. It's not just Google, but there's a whole bunch of uh, it's a new generation of hardware around deep learning. And what's interesting about it is, if you're just sort of training the networks, the the key to this hardware is that you don't need high precision. If you're just sort of walking a gradient and you're saying make it bigger or smaller, you can use 16-bit floats. And even for the imputation, you don't need it to be that accurate. So the, this hardware is ridiculously blazingly fast on very low precision arithmetic calculations, and it does lots and lots of them, which is what you need for training. And I, I just, you know, I love hardware, so I put these pictures up. Water cooled, and you know, Google is now racking out what would have been the biggest supercomputer a few years ago, like every week just for training. And you know, my team uses, you know, a few years ago before the TPUs came out, we were using on order of, you know, a billion CPU hours. And now it's like it's not even worth counting. And we, we actually get yelled at because we're not using enough cycles and we waste a lot of cycles. So it's one of the fun things about being at Google. Um, and you know, this hardware is coming out on the, on the phones too. So there's a whole new generation of chips, not so much for the training, but yeah, at least now for imputation. But there's going to be a lot of training that you're going to see on the devices too. And this is sort of one of the secrets to how it's going to be more private is that you'll be able to do incremental training without ever shipping the data back. So you know now you can do imputation. All the new phones have the imputation engines, but there'll be training engines on the phone too. For, you know, sort of a federated learning scheme, and there's a lot of work going into that. So let me, let me let's go through some quick consumer examples. You know, I travel a lot, and this app is amazing. If you haven't used Google Translate, please download it and try it. Uh, this is a pretty amazing version, especially if you don't know how to type the language that you're in. There's actually four different predictions going on here. One is which pixels in the image have letters. The second is to turn the pictures of letters into actual letters. The third is to translate the letters. And then the fourth is to pick a nice font for when you replace it. And it's pretty incredible. I mean, I go to Japan, and I can go, you know, I, I leave the Western hotels, and I go where the locals are eating, and I can pretty much get by. And you know, every once in a while, you get custard instead of tea, but you know, it works pretty well, actually. But I, the important point on this one also is that you know, the models might t it might take a fleet of computers to train the models, but you can get them running locally. So this is critical for medical devices, for smart devices in the home, all sorts of things. You know, I'm waiting for the device to come out. My mother's older, and I would love it if there was a device that could detect when she was in trouble. But there's no way that she's going to stream the video and audio from her living room up to the web. But imagine if there was a local model that could really very intelligently detect that. So I don't think that's very far away. So this is, this is funny, too. So the smart reply. So in 2009, you know, Google has this tradition of April Fool's jokes. So in 2009, the April Fool's joke was, let's do something that writes the email. So we shipped this in 2016, and it very quickly became a significant double-digit percentage of all email sent. So, and again, this is not picking off a list. This is like, if you use it for a while, it starts speaking in your voice. It's kind of creepy, actually. It's, uh, it works really well. Um, and then two years later, we now do it on every keystroke. So you can imagine, you know, for the engineers in the audience, you can imagine how complicated these systems are. We're, we're literally doing it on every keystroke now in, in Gmail, and it works really well. Um, so, so this is, uh, you know, it's not just that it's amazing, it's moving at an amazing pace. <laughs> yes, it's great. Um, so Go is another one that I think is really interesting. Um, you probably have heard about the, the big contest. And essentially, the way this network worked 
you know, um, well, let me contrast this with like IBM and Deep Blue. So that was an absolutely amazing technical achievement. I don't know, 25 years ago or how, how long it was, but it was almost the epitome of the old style of programming. They memorized the openings, they memorized the closes, they wrote a lot of rules about chess, about points, and then they sort of played through the games. And when they beat Kasparov, we didn't learn anything more about chess. We just learned that computers were finally able to, you know, tough out a human. And Kasparov was pretty pissed off too. Um, uh, um, the Go thing was completely different. Like Go is a Go is a very simple game. You have white and black stones. You just put them on. If you surround territory, you own that territory, and whoever owns the most territory at the, at the end wins. Incredibly simple game, but but very very complicated strategy. And people had expected that it would be another 10 or 15 years in terms of like the number of games you can play are hugely many 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 more orders of magnitude than chess. And the strategy, like you can have a configuration which is really powerful, but can it be blocked with one stone? or you can be weak on one part of the board and really strong on another part of the board and how do you write the rules that combine that and the, the amazing work that the, that the team, our, our London team did is they basically built two networks one could look at the board and predict where the next move would likely be and then the second network which still almost feels magic to me is it could look at a board with all its complexity and just predict a number between zero and one who's advantaged white or black and it integrated all these complex strategies, all this like where you are, you know, how you are on the board, absolutely amazing. And you know, when we played the South Korean uh, champion, there was uh, two games that were really shocking. That was like some, one is where he beat us and another where they called it the God move. It was the most amazing unexpected move. So behind the scenes, both of those were like one in 10,000 moves on the, on the next likely move probability graph. It was just very surprising. But a few years, you know, less than a year later, when we played the absolute world champion, a young Chinese gentleman, it was never even close. Like we beat him in every game. And what was really interesting is that, you know, in interviews afterwards, of course he was upset for having lost. But, you know, this person, he's really a remarkable person. His whole thing was about understanding the game of Go better. And what was kind of magical about AlphaGo was that it discovered completely new ways of playing that no human in 3,000 years of playing this game had ever seen before. So there was a couple of things like um, the, the computer was doing what people were calling slacker moves. And they were like, it was like doing these safe moves that a human never would have done. And it turns out that, you know, the computer is just as happy to win by one as it is to win by many. And it caused people to rethink, hey, maybe we're playing this game overly aggressively and these slacker moves are, you know, I, th I think the computer showed they are the right thing to do. There was this other like fifth line attack that nobody had seen or nobody had understood before. And you know, one of our hopes in, in our team of applying deep learning in a scientific context is, can we do the same things? Can we see things that have never been seen before and at least bring them to the attention of the scientists to understand? Because you know, at the end of the day, these things are just correlation engines. That's, that's, they're statistical correlation engines. And correlation is not causation, but correlation is highly correlated with causation. So, <laughs> you know, let the machine dig up the correlations and then some of them might actually be causal. Unfortunately, I'll show you a bunch of cases where the correlations are, are, are totally wrong and you have to be extremely careful when you're using that. So um, one last consumer example is, you know, again, uh, this sort of partially reflects on the rate of change, but I think less than two years later, um, the team in London came out with AlphaGo Zero. So AlphaGo was bootstrapped on human games and then it just started playing itself and they leapfrogged versions to get better and better. With AlphaGo Zero, they just explained the rules of the game and the machine started playing itself. And in a very short period of time, relatively speaking, it became way better than the one that was sort of, I don't know, maybe poisoned by human games. Uh, you know, it was, it was um, a, absolutely incredible. And in the few hours of training that they had left, they explained it, the, they, they taught it the rules of chess, and it very quickly became the best chess player. Now realize for 25 years, the best chess player has been the product of large numbers of programmers writing chess programs, right? And like, you know, checking in some small optimization and somebody will figure out, oh, this is how to do it better. Like the collective work of thousands of brilliant people and in a few hours, this thing just blew past it. So if you think about how, you know, a lot of things are gonna be changed by 
machine learning, the job of being a programmer is going to change uh, quite significantly also. And I'll show you that in, in an example in uh, genomics. So this is, you know, this is where we're in, we're in interesting times. So, oh wait, before I go to scientific examples, this is, this is another good one. So how many people have heard of Deep Dream? Yeah, okay, so what's happening here is you have an image and you run it through a recognizer and one of the things you can do is you can start changing these images. So you start modifying the image and what was done here is to say, let's pick a level, this was a fairly low level in the network, I don't remember exactly, in the sort of 23 level deep inception network, this may have been level five or seven or something like that, and modify the pixels in the image to better light up those nodes. So you start to see, there's a funny story, they called it Deep Dream, about what is the computer dreaming about. And here's another great example. So you see these beautiful landscapes and you see the waterfall back there. So when you start dreaming, it was just like, okay, it thinks it sees a mouse, so let's make it more mouse-like. And like this waterfall becomes a bird, you can kind of see that, and you know, the dogs and the faces and the pagodas. And so it was like, you know, it's kind of cool, there was actually an art exhibit about that. And it, you, know, you begin to visualize what the network is doing. But then this happened, so when the, when the system thought it saw a barbell, it started materializing barbells according to what, you know, changing the pixels in the image so the computer thought it was more like a barbell, and the barbells had arms attached to them. So, which makes perfect sense because the images that it was trained on, you know, there was a lot of arms attached to the barbell, so the computer, arms and barbells were brought together. But this is really, it's a really important point because it's very easy to look at these networks and say, wow, they're so smart, they must be doing what I'm doing. And, and again, they're not. It's just statistical correlation. There's no higher reasoning. I mean, people are working on that. But you know, a, a, a person would never make this mistake, right? There's metal and there's flesh and there's, they just don't go together. But the, the barbells had arms. So you have to be really careful. You get amazing results, but don't anthropomorphize what these machines are doing. Like, check it, investigate it constantly. So, so then GANs came out. So GANs are really cool. If you think about like a machine learning when you're training the model, you're like, well, you know, there's a cat in this image, so I want you to say 1.0 for a cat, and it says 0.5, and you, you tweak the weights to get it closer to 1. But your loss function is pretty straightforward. Is, is it a cat or not? But um, uh, uh, Ian Goodfellow uh, sort of thought this through and said, you know, our loss function doesn't have to be just this simple 1.0 or does it match the label. Why not train a network as the loss function. For example, train a network on saying, does that photograph look realistic or not? Does this face look like a celebrity's face or not? And then essentially, you now have these generative models, somewhat like with Deep Dream, where you can start generating images and training images, and you essentially train a forgery detector, and then you have a forger, and you lock the two in the room together until the forger can fool the, the, the forgery detector. And this is really wild stuff. And I don't know if you've seen it, and there's, I've got a bunch of links in that document about there's a, there's a video floating around where you can basically make Obama say anything. And, you know, because you can synthesize people's voice now with these generative models, you can synthesize these images. So, you know, in the world of fake news, this is, this is quite interesting. And, you know, I pointed, I was talking to my son about this. He's like, Dad, we survived Photoshop, so we'll survive this. But, you know, th this, this is a big deal. This is really interesting. But there's a lot of use for this. Like, this was the New York Times case about, like, synthetic celebrities. There was an article just today that, you know, fully synthetic actors, if you do design in video games, a lot of video game landscapes and designs are going to be built by GANs now. Um, but, but there's really cool stuff you can do. So there's a cycle GAN. So one of the things you can do is say, you know, uh, this looks like a horse, this looks like a zebra, and then modify the images to basically turn the horses into zebras and back again. And we actually use this in a medical context because, like, for example, um, we, we discovered, I'll get into this in a bit, but we discovered that doctors were terribly misdiagnosing this disease called um, diabetic macular edema and sort of the swelling of the macula. And we were able to get sort of like really good ground truth data for this. And then we wanted to teach the doctors what they were doing wrong. So we were able to basically train GANs to turn on different levels of DME and we, you know, of macular edema. We could take an image and give it macular edema or have one with it and, and turn it out and, until we could sort of teach the humans how to do it better. So there's interesting uses for these technologies, but it's crazy. I don't know if you've seen this, but you can turn photographs into things that look like a painter. You, you know, they've taken original paintings and turned them into photographs. It's kind of you know, like Monet's beautiful landscape turned into photographs is upsetting for some reason. So, um, uh, so let me switch gears now. Um, is, this, is this about the right pace? Is this, is this good? Yeah, okay. Um, so let me go into medical imaging a bit. So um, 
I'm going to quickly touch on, on a few of these. Um, I'll try to go quickly. So um, roughly about 10% of the world is going to get diabetes. It's a bigger, it's a growing problem in the developing world because of the Im improving diets. You know, it's sort of, it's, it's, I guess it's, you know, you can have worse problems than that, but diabetes is, is bad. And when you get diabetes, it um, damages, it can damage your blood vessels while people need amputation. For about a third of diabetics, they get a disease called diabetic retinopathy, which is a breakdown of the blood vessels in your eye. And for about a third of them, it's vision threatening. So it's sort of 10%, a third, a third, it's about a 1% prevalence disease, but it is the fastest growing cause of blindness in the world. And diabetic retinopathy is just evaluated on this five-point scale from, from none to proliferative. It's not symptomatic until it's proliferative. And if you could see these images, like the orange spots that you're seeing, what's happening there is the plasma is leaking out of the blood vessel and then drying. They call that an exudate. And the dark spots you're seeing, those are actually hemorrhages where the, the blood vessel broke and the, you know, the, it clotted. And um, there's just not nearly enough doctors. I mean, nobody should go blind from this, and way too many people go blind from this. And you know, there's, you know, they've been setting up clinics in India and Thailand and Indonesia all over, and then trying to train people to read those images. And it's actually quite challenging to read those images. So, uh, DR is a wonderful starter problem for um, machine learning because you don't actually need the full uh, patient record. You could just, if you get the image of the eye, you could just diagnose it from there. So we did this in a sort of typically Google fashion. I, tran I traveled the world and got lots and lots of images. We hired 50 plus doctors to grade them. And what was interesting is we tried lots of different machine learning models. And you know, Inception v4, the same thing that won the ImageNet contest, was more than good enough to do this. So there was no magic in the ML. It was completely a data gathering and data labeling exercise. So. Um, uh, so, so we did this. We we got you know we hired all of these doctors. We labeled all these images, and you know we we really we didn't want to publish this in Nature. We didn't just want to, this to be a, a technical project to show look we could do this. We wanted to start changing the practice of medicine. So it was a very very long negotiation to get this paper published in JAMA. We actually had to do a clinical trial in India to prove it out, and it, this is a, this became sort of a landmark paper that sort of opened the floodgates of the FDA, you know, now changing the sort of the approval process for some of these things. And we, we essentially were working, you know, as well as a sort of board certified US ophthalmologist. And if you're gonna take one thing away from this slide, like this this talk, this is actually a critical slide. So what you're looking at here is the columns are the best of the ophthalmologists we hired. The rows were patient images that were selected because they were challenging, and the color was the diagnosis, okay? So the bottom two are clearly sick. Every doctor agreed that they were sick, and the top one was probably healthy. But this rainbow of diagnoses, the two in black got every single diagnosis. This is how medicine is practiced today. And I show this slide to engineers, and they were all like, to a person like, we have to do better. They're like, this is crazy. And you show it to a bunch of doctors, and they're like, well, you know, what do you expect? We're human. You know, it's just, it's, it's not easy to do this. And, you know, so, so the intra-grader consistency, this is we would give the same image to the same doctor like a week later. This is only a five-point scale. It was essentially only two and three that we would get the same answer from the same doctor on the same image within a week. Across doctors, it was 60%, which actually was, was not as bad as we had thought it would be. I showed these to some of the top pathologists at one of the top um, medical centers in the US, and they were like, we never get 65%, like 60, we, you know, we get 30%. And I, you know, my jaw hit the floor, and he's like, well, it's not really that bad. Pathology grading is much more technical, and you know, there are way fewer therapies than there are um, grades. So in terms of therapy concordance, it's more like 85%. So what that means is that you have a one in six chance of being treated differently if only a single pathologist looks at your image than if, say, a group of pathologists look at it. So the one takeaway is get a second opinion on the pathology. And I've given this talk before, and I have had like very prestigious people and you know, well-known scientists come up to me and say, my wife's best friend had a biopsy. They did a double mastectomy. They always do the redo the pathology after they remove the tissue, and you know she never had breast cancer. So she'll win a big lawsuit, but I think she would rather be whole again. So this is what's this is what's going on today. So we have to fix this. So the thing about diabetic retinopathy is it's a, it's kind of a slow-moving disease. If you don't catch it now, you can catch it next year. The current 
uh, estimates on um, uh, breast cancer diagnosis. So you know, the reason why we're making good progress in, in cancer is because we're able to identify different substrata of patients and say, look, you have HER2 positive breast cancer. It's very different than ER positive or PR positive. And there's a therapy specifically for that kind of cancer. So for HER2 positive, and I'm very sensitive to this because my mom had HER2 positive breast cancer, there is this amazing drug called Herceptin from Genentech, and it's, just, it's a miracle drug. It knocked her completely into remission. The way they determine whether a woman is HER2 positive is they do an antibody stain and it fluoresces and the pathologist reads it. The current estimates are about 10% of those patients. It's misread. So either the woman is getting Herceptin, which has side effects and it's very expensive and it's not going to help her, or even more tragically, here is this miracle drug on the shelf that took decades of work and billions of dollars in treasure, and she's not getting it. She's dying because you know, the, 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 a missed read. But you know, it's not the pathologist's fault. It's, this is really, really hard stuff to do. So anyway, we need to fix this. We absolutely need to fix this. So, um, so what we realized going into this, again, I told you how it's a data problem. So from, from 2016, we'll come back to this, from 2016 to 2018, when we had the newest version, we basically went from being as good as a general ophthalmologist to being as good as a panel of retinal specialists. Like, you know, our diagnostic now is essentially the best diagnostic in the world. The only difference was that we curated the test data. So it turns out, you know, I showed you that rainbow chart. We gathered about seven diagnoses for each patient. So we're afterwards, we were able to do a sensitivity analysis to say for the training data, you know, how many of those labels were needed. And it turns out that like two, maybe three labels and a consensus between them was more than enough. So these machines are remarkably robust against dirty training data, but for the test data, seven wasn't enough. So we actually now, you know, this is what, what this picture is, we, can, we used to convene adjudication panels where we would basically bring retinal specialists in for a week to sit there arguing over each image. Then we built a whole tool that they could sort of do this remotely. And by just curating the test set, we got from, again, as good as a, a regular doctor to as good as a panel of specialists. So as you're going out there and doing these you know, machine learning projects, do not be afraid of dirty training data, but exquisitely curate your test set as much as you can. And the reason for this, even though you never train on the test set, you can build millions of models. It's like, which is the best model? And the performance on the test set tells you what the best model is. So really, really concentrate on your test data. So then we said, okay, so we had, um, we, you know, we were able to predict diabetic retinopathy, it was great. Um, you know, you probably know Google has this history of sort of 20% projects. And there was a young woman who she had recently graduated and she really wanted to work on this project, but she didn't really know ML very well and she was in some other part of Google. And we said, well, why don't you take these retinal images and we know, you know, male or female, or at least sort of self-expressed male, female in these images. Why don't you see if you could predict that? And there's like, it's not going to work, but it's a good exercise, you know, try it and all that. So she came back to us about three weeks later and says, yeah, I, I can pretty much tell male or female in, in the retina. And like, there, there's nothing in the literature that says male retinas and female retinas are different. We're now at about a 97% AUC. So, so this was a case where, you know, the features of, of diabetic retinopathy we kind of knew. You look for exudates, you look for hemorrhages. We had no idea, nobody had any idea that male and female retinas were different. And you know what, we, we still don't know why. So where the predictions localize, there's all sorts of techniques that you can do about, you know, which pixels are contributing the most to the prediction. And where the, there's papers coming out about this, about how do you explain what the model is doing. Or you can do a GAN that, you know, turns it from male to female and back again. And we've sat down and we've got the GANs that do this and turn it from a quintessentially female to quintessentially male. And the, the ophthalmologists stare at it and say, I have no idea what's going on here. So we still don't know. We can cut the images into 64 by 64 blocks and scramble them. And the it's not quite 0.97, but it's still pretty good. So it's a, probably a localized feature. It might be in some high-level correlation structure. We still don't know. And it, it's funny because I keep having people work on this, and they're like, oh, this should be easy. And then they, they stop in frustration after a few months. But we will solve this problem. But there's all sorts of other things we can see. We can see age. We can see blood pressure. Um, we can uh, you know, tell what size glasses you need. So for a young kid who maybe can't take an eye test, we can take a picture of their fundus and tell them what level of uh, eyeglasses that they need. Um, and very interestingly, we can actually do a whole cardiovascular risk assessment. So there's this thing called the Framingham score, which comes from the famous Framingham study where they followed people for 50, 60, 70 years now in Framingham, Mass. 
And we can essentially tell that just from a picture of the eye. This is the risk of having a significant cardiovascular event. So who knows? We're looking for more signal. We're looking for glaucoma and AMD. We're looking for neurodegenerative disease without markers. So this is just one of those cases where we don't even know what features to look for, but, but deep learning finds them. You got to have lots of examples, though. So let me switch quickly to radiology. So, you know, we, um, oh, that woman is on the team now, by the way. She's doing great. She's actually coming back for a PhD. Um, so we had, we had a bunch of, um, these were uh, brain MRIs for Alzheimer's. So of course now everybody says, can we predict male or female? And you know, sure enough, you see the AUCs, that's 0.99999, like of, of course we could tell male and female. So a natural conclusion is, well, male and female brains are completely different, right? Um, well, someone had the wherewithal to say, well, what if we just cut a picture of the brain out and try to predict just on the extracted square and then also try to predict on without the brain? So it turns out that if you cut the brain out, it's still 0.997. And if you're just linking the brain, it's only about 0.80. So sort of this is a case, and I don't know exactly what it's seeing. It's something in the facial features or in the jawline. I don't know where it is, but it would be very easy to just say, oh, look, you know, Male and female brains are totally different, and you're locking in on some confounding variables that you don't uh, understand. And the computer is very, very glad to do that. So, so be careful. You know, as you're doing these problems, you know, try to predict the things you shouldn't predict. Try to think about what might be tricking you. Like there are confounding variables everywhere, and it's very embarrassing if you like announce Eureka and it's because there there was some text in the middle, or you know, the, the sick people go to one lab and the healthy people go to another lab, and you're just seeing the difference between the illumination at the labs or something like that. There are there are confounding variables everywhere, so be careful. And if the results are too good, they probably are. Um, so let me talk about pathology. So, you know, I talked about earlier about uh, breast cancer. You can imagine all sorts of things you can do with pathology, like find similar cases. You know, doctors reason by example, you know, and we have a system that's called Smiley. We just launched it. That's really cool. Can you just highlight the cancerous regions so to, you know, focus the pathologist's attention as to where to look? Could you recapitulate what the pathologist would say? You know, just get the pathologist to do the reports. Can you just go from image to report? And we're working on all of those. The one that I'm most excited about is essentially to rewrite the books on pathology. So like when a man has um, uh, prostate, uh, gets a prostate biopsy, it's evaluated with this thing called the Gleason score. And Gleason was a brilliant pathologist, and he looked at a huge number of samples, and he built a model in his head, and then he codified it in a guide, which they teach to pathologists, which you hope they're having a good day when they read your slide. And you can look at this. It's a two-part score, and you can look up the crisis of Gleason 7s. So basically, if you have eight or higher, they treat you aggressively, and six or lower, they kind of watch you, and seven is the pathologist giving it to the oncologist to make a decision. But we, you know, we could try to reproduce the Gleason score, and we have a paper where we did that quite accurately, but why not just throw the whole thing away and just redo what Gleason did? We can look at a, a million samples. We can see how nature labeled the data, right? Did it progress? Did it not? Was it, did it aggressively metastasize? And, and relearn you know, basically redo pathology. So I think this is gonna, gonna happen over the next few years. But let me, let me talk about something that's just super practical. So it turns out that focus on the images has a big effect on model quality. Now realize that, you know, the scale of that is shifted, but you know, you guys know about AUC curves. It's like every little bit is another patient that's sort of slipping through. So here's an example where this is a, a pathology slide, and like these are the predictions about the cancerous regions. Like, what is, is there really a stripe of cancer in the corner there? Like, what's going on there? And it turned out that um, the image was out of focus. It was just from the pathology scanner. And so, you know, it's not enough to do the predictions. You have to go and look for all the things that might go wrong and you sort of understand, you know, how well do you know what you think you know. And so we actually built a model to train just to predict image quality. And we open sourced it and we actually gave the Broad a grant and the guys who do Image J a grant. These are the, the typical image processing tools to incorporate these models into their tools for, for people to use. And um, so then we got, you know, we're Google, so we went off and bought a bunch of scanners and tried them all. And like, you get these, this one's a pretty good one. Um, this one has this weird striping pattern here. Um, this one was, uh, it might have been a sample prep problem, you know, so the color is the, is the focus level. Um, it might have been a sample prep where they didn't quite cut it flat. So like, you, you, you know, you practically, you need to look at all of these things before you just make a prediction. 
So let me get into more practical. We had these amazing models. We could, we could detect METs. It was, uh, the AUC was great. So we said, well, let's do a reader study, right? We give the pathologists our, our models, and it's sitting there with the pathologists. They're going to be happier. It's, they're going to be faster. They're going to be more, more accurate. For the first version of that, none of that was true. <laughs> they were less happy. They were less accurate. And they were slower in doing it. And there's a bunch of reasons. Um, just as an example, you know, you worry about false positives and false negatives. So if you're doing screening, if you're screening people for blindness, you know, I'd love to set up eye scanners in train stations in India. A lot of people in India don't even know they have diabetes. Can we detect them? But if it's it's a one percent prevalence disease, so for 99 percent accurate, you know, every other case will be a false positive and will flood their their health system. But so, but in this case, it turns out that humans, or at least human pathologists, are very good at dispensing with false positives. So if the, the computer says, look here, the pathologist can look at it and say, don't worry about that. But they're actually much worse with false negatives because they tend to trust the computer. So if the computer misses something, the doctor is going to miss it. So if the doctor knows that the computer is going to have false negatives, you know, she has to <laughs> reread the image. Like she has to deal with everything the computer says. And then she has to do a de novo read anyway, because she's ultimately responsible for that patient's health. So where you set the operating point matters a lot based on the context. And then how you actually show the data. Like our first version, we would like, you know, mark the tumor, but the person wants to see the tumor, so you kind of have to mark around it. But after doing some, you know, some some iterations. Now they are happier, they're faster, and they're more accurate. But the point here is don't just assume because you have this amazing ML model that's just going to drop into some existing workflow. You really have to like understand what the humans are doing, how to engage the humans. I mean, if, if it's a totally like automated system, maybe not. But if, you, if, if humans are involved, as they often are, you need to really think these things through. So let me drop one, down one level. I, I, is it, I might run a little bit late. Is that OK? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it tight. So let me go into microscopy. So one of the amazing things you can do with machine learning is it's called image to image regression. So if you have pairs of highly correlated images, you can learn to predict one from the other. And this kind of makes sense. Like if you have a normal photograph, like if I showed you that photograph, you could kind of tell which chair is in front of the other chair and is the chair is in front of the door and the desk is in front of the chair. Humans can tell that. And you know, it's funny because a few years ago, like if a human could do it, it, it said nothing about whether the computer could do it. And now it's like if a human can do it and there's training data, of course we could teach the machine to do it. Like uh, we want, my team wants to do stuff that humans can't even do, like, like you know, see age from, from your retina. But anyway, so image to image regression works. It's like this is in your ca camera now to do selfies, you know, we could tell when it's a selfie by looking at the depth, and then you could do all these sort of like cute photo effects. So we said, you know, there's a lot of um, sort of the gold standard in reading uh, microscopy images is uh, immunohistochemistry or staining, where they're sort of staining the, the proteins or the biological models in the cell. There's a stain called DAPI, which like binds to DNA, where you could see the nucleus, you can stain membranes, you can stain all of these different structures. But sometimes you don't want to do the staining. It might be the case that you want to keep the cells alive. So there was some really interesting work that came out of Gladstone a few years ago where you know, people with neurodegenerative disease, they end up with these plaques in their brain. So people thought, oh, well, the plaques are like the tombstones of the brain. Gladstone was able to show that cells that make plaques live longer than cells that don't. So you probably have these misfolded proteins which are damaging the cells. And the cells that sort of aggregate them into plaques and then eventually recycle them do better. Eventually, they're just overwhelmed by the plaques. So the only way they could do that, though, is with time lapse. They had to track the cells over time. And, but so if you look at that image on the left, it's very hard to read what's going on versus here. So we said, hey, can we use image to image regression to take bright field microscopy or maybe hyperspectral microscopy or you know, pathology slides that were stained years ago with standard stains and learn to impute the deeper labels? And, and the answer is we, we kind of can. You know, Not for everything. We're obviously not seeing protein expression. But if there's enough morphological clues in an image like that, and then we can get training data from the fluorescence like that, we can learn to predict it. So in this case, blue is um, uh, nucleus is a DAPI stain, and green is propidium iodide, which uh, selectively binds to dead cells. So you can look at this. This is the original. And you know, like we kind of killed this cell here, right here, but it looks kind of weird anyway. So it's pretty good. It's not great. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. These are human neurons. Uh, image with phase contrast, and this is a dendrite and axon stain, and it's pretty good. You know, it, it, it's certainly good enough for typing of the cells. 
So uh, there's all sorts of uses for this. Um, it turns out tissue can, will autofluoresce. Human, you know, animal tissue autofluoresces. But the thing is, so you can take, if you have, like, say, a small biopsy, you'd like to you know, preserve it to do the genomics on it, but you also want to see the architecture of the tumor. So you can hit it you know, with, with fluorescence, but you know, who knows, nobody knows how to read the 600 nanometer image or the 580 nanometer image. But what you can do is sort of take an, a, a, a hyperspectral stack and then sacrifice some of the samples and stain them, and then learn to predict the stain from the hyperspectral stack. So it's a very, very cool technology. We open source the data, the models, everything. It was published in Cell last year. It's a very cool technique for like lifting information out of biological images. But then what happens if you've got lots and lots of images? How do you compare them? So there's another wonderful um, machine learning technology called embeddings. And the idea of embeddings is you train a network to produce a vector such that similar inputs, the vectors are closer together. And closer together can be whatever you define it to be. And if as long as you're, there's some consistency, there's some deep structure that the, the network can lock in on, it will learn it. So for example, this is, this is how facial recognition works. So you, know, you, you, ha you have two pictures of the same person and, and one of a different, and you want the two vectors of that person to, to, to be closer together. And you train this a billion times, and it is frighteningly accurate. And so what's interesting is you know, prior generations of facial recognition, you'd have to do feature engineering, right? You'd have to find the eyes and the nose and the mouth and see how far apart the eyes are, and what if they're wearing glasses, and what if it's a profile. And here, you, know, you don't have to do any of that. You just give the machine the raw data, and it figures out what the essential difference is. And there's some interesting stories, because you know, we roll this stuff out inside Google, and you know, parents were complaining complaining that we had mistagged the kids. And we're like, are you sure? And they would, they would write us back and, oh, no, you were right. I was, you know, I had the wrong kid in the, in the image. Or even telling identical twins apart. So you know, the stuff works really well. And it's just, again, these embedding vectors. So your face is essentially a cluster center in these image recognition algorithms. And if you take a picture of an arbitrary person and get the vector from that image, and you go looking for the nearest cluster center, it's really good odds it's going to be you. It's not perfect, but uh, it's good odds. So, the same thing with words. So we trained a, a network with words. This is actually older work from 2013, where words were considered similar if they co-occurred on the web. And this amazing deep structure emerged where like Berlin minus Germ the vector for Berlin minus the vector for Germany plus the vector for Russia pointed to Moscow. So we never told it about countries. We never told it about cities. We never told it about capitals, or the countries have capitals or cities. And yet this latent structure emerged. Conjugates of a verb, they would be in a different pot place in the space, but they would have the same relationship relative to each other. So these networks are amazing at finding this uh, deep structure. So we said, can we apply this to drug screening? So the way drug screening works now is they'll have, you'll have some hypothesis. You know, they, they grow the cells or whatever in these wells, and they, they treat them with lots of compounds and lots of uh, doses. And then they have some theory about what's going to happen. You know, this cancer drug is going to kill these cells, or this is going to cause this protein to express. So they have a theory going in, and they build these assays where they pull two, three, five numbers out of these images. But these images are incredibly rich stories about what's going on in the cells. And like, here's, this is a real example from a Broad study where at some sort of mid-level dose, blue is DAPI again, at some mid-level dose, this, this cancer drug was turning these cells into these multinucleated monstrosities. And then you turn the dose up higher, and it, and it kills them. And so you never would have seen that if your assay was just, are they alive or dead, or count the cells. You never would have seen this. And we, and we love this Asimov quote, you know, the most exciting thing in science isn't, you know, Eureka, I found it. It's, oh, that's kind of weird. What's going on here? So what we want to do is basically go from this model where you sort of pluck out a couple of features out of the image to just mapping the images in an almost hypothesis-free way. I mean, it's not quite a hypothesis-free way because the way you paint the cells and the way you stain them is, you know, but, but there are these standard cell painting assays where you're just painting basic structures of the cell and then just put them in a morphological state. So essentially what we need to do, it's two simple problems. You can imagine training an undergrad to do this come in and look at the controls. And there's actually quite a lot of visual variation in the controls. All of that stuff is boring. Now look at the cells that we've treated, that we've squirted juice on. Did something interesting happen, and which are more or less alike? 
So if we can do those two things, learn what's boring you know, from the controls, then learn what's interesting, this whole world of research opens up. You know, I ideally would like the dimensions of the vector to be meaningful, and you know, we believe that we'll be able to project it into spaces to do that. But that's not even uh, sort of critical. So we took this, again, this Broad study, and it was, you know, they had 38, uh, they, they had, uh, 38 drugs in this study, 12 different mechanisms of action. So you know, some of the drugs had the same mechanism of action. Um, a bunch of different concentrations. And these cells are all actually painted. These are cells that were treated with different amounts of different drugs, painted with the identical assays. So you could see some things materialize, some things don't. And then the game became, can you, can you look at a, a, a picture of the cell and sort of say what happened to it based on what happened with the neighbors? And we got these just incredible results. So you're, what you're seeing here is a T-SNE plot where the vectors, the multidimensional vectors are projected down to two dimensions. And if you see, like, the colors were added later. If you see those three blue ones on the, on the, on the bottom there, so those are three different compounds that all had the same mechanism of action. Um, so what they did, the major thing that they did to the cells was all the same. They all clustered right near each other. But each one had some secondary effect that wasn't really accounted for. So they all you know, were right next to each other, but in distinct subgroups. And somewhat unexpectedly, at extremely low doses, the cells started moving almost linearly in embedding space from where they started to sort of where they ended up. So we could start to see phenotypes emerging from incredibly low doses of these drugs. So this has become sort of a totally different way of doing it. And, and the results were so ridiculously good. We didn't believe them, as, as you shouldn't if you get great results. So uh, Verily is another alphabet company. We had them do the same study, but with four times as big, 60% controls, five replicates and and the results were just as good so this is this is really amazingly good and you know we started to see this is not your typical dose response curve but this is distance and embedding space again so we started to see really low doses of this so we kicked off a whole bunch of projects around this stuff around can we look at um, cells across people and stratify them into different disease categories can we look for new mechanism of action of, of you know for antibiotics can we look for new ways of killing cells new compounds that do the killing and we don't know yet whether the vectors compose where we can sort of mixing drugs and we're doing those experiments so this sort of opens up completely new worlds of research and there's if you're interested in this there's two companies that are doing this one called in citro by Daphne Kohler who is the sort of great AI person from Stanford and another one called recursion pharmaceuticals nearby that are and then Ann uh, Carpenter's lab at the Broad is doing great work here too so let me just do, I think we have a few minutes left. Let me do just sort of a quick survey. And again, our team does everything from nuclear fusion to, to tools for people with disabilities. So it's pretty wild. Again, please go look at that document for more background. So let me just show you something real quick about genomics. So you guys have seen this curve. You know, genomics, the cost of genomics is dropping significantly faster than Moore's law. And the secret to why the, why this technology is able to work is that it's been quantity over quality. So they essentially, the, these, these new sequencers do huge numbers of very dirty reads. But if you do enough of them and you understand the sort of the error models of the machine, you can sort of figure out what the right answer is from lots and lots of dirty reads. And you know, the basic thing is taking all these dirty reads and doing variant calling. So from the, you know, I got, I've got 30x coverage or 50x coverage, every base is read 50 times, what's the actual genome? So what we were able to do is to take, you know, let's just sort of do some basic alignment, pile them up, basically like draw them out as an image. And then we knew what we put on the machine, so we're able to predict the, the top line of the image was what the right answer is. And we're able to learn to predict the top line basically from the reads. And we won this big FDA award. It's called Deep Variant. It's all open sourced. If you're doing work in genomics, take a look at it. And here's the, here's the takeaway slide is that each of the sequencing companies hired teams of programmers that deeply knew the error models of their machine to build a variant caller. And Deep Variant was better than, than all of them except for one. And I think now this is a dated slide. We're better than that one also. So teams of programmers like implementing error models Forget it. Just learn through it with the data and let the machine figure out the pattern. Um, and there's all sorts of new sort of um, uh, sequencing work going on. So let me talk real quickly about biomarkers. So you know, I talked about how we make progress in cancer by identifying types and then developing therapies for each type. 
for things like neurodegenerative disease, they, they are so far away. Like, they can't even do patient stratification. Like, Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, it's almost certainly many different diseases the way cancer is with different underlying mechanisms. And the diseases now are just characterized by the symptoms, not by the cause. And, you know, they're not finding any drugs. You know, Herceptin never would have been approved if there wasn't for the HER2 test to go along with it. Because again, it's an expensive drug, it's dangerous, and it only works on a few people. But for those people, like my mom, it's a miracle. And the way that um, a lot of neurodegenerative disease are assessed is it's, it's, it's the best we could do, but it's terrible. It's like a subjective measure. The patient comes into the doctor, they have a 25 minute exam, and the doctor says walk across, and he gives you a score of, about how steady you are, and you know, they ask you questions about, you know, do, can you dress yourself? And you know, patients, uh, most patients want to hide it, and they're like, yes, they can dress themselves, but they don't wear bow ties anymore. Or can you feed yourself? It's like, yes, but I don't buy gallons of milk anymore. Now I buy pints of milk so I can feed myself. So these assessments are terrible. And so, you know, um, and, and there's all sorts of problems with it. it. Again, not just that we don't understand the disease, but we can't even sort of stratify the patients. So with ALS in particular, they have this 10-point uh, score. It's called the FRS score, the Functional Response Score. And again, it's very, very, very subjective. Um, and one of them is with the voice. So we did this project with a local uh, Boston group, a fantastic institute called uh, ALS TDI, where we just took patients' voices and said, can we predict their FRS score? And, and we could do it quite accurately. The patients just said a single phrase, like, I owe you a yo-yo today, or something like that. And we're able to predict it uh, quite accurately. The green is the, is the FRS score that you know, multiple doctors consulted on, sort of curated values. And the blue is what the machine is predicting. Um, so with these, better, with these better biomarkers, there's all sorts of things you can do. Like it, it has a remarkably high uh, dramatic impact. So for example, you, one is you can stratify patients. You can break them into different types of disease. The second is you could predict progression better. So if you've got much more objective measures, if your error bars on assessing disease are smaller, you can have fewer people in a drug trial. And drug trials are very expensive, and so if you can have fewer people and get an accurate measure statistically, that's a big deal. You can measure that person's progress against themselves. So instead of saying, okay, this is how the group behaved, you can measure, like, especially for rare diseases, what happened with its individual. So more accurate biomarkers are really important. And now, so the voice stuff worked great. There's a, hopefully a nature paper coming out on this. We got the accelerometer data from these patients too, doing simple exercises. And um, we're uh, really excited about this. I think we actually, between the voice and the accelerometer data, we think that we can predict all 10 FRS scores. So again, this is just we're chipping away at these diseases about, hey, can we stratify them? Can we reduce, stratify the patients, reduce the number of people in the trial? So it's slow progress, but we are making progress. So um, an another quick thing is um, uh, in silico evolution. So it turns out that you know, nature does lots of experiments all the time. And so you've got these sequences, and you get a different sequence. It could be just an error in copying. And you know, a lot of people are working on, can I go from sequence to structure, like in proteins, because the structure tells you a lot. We're kind of, uh, the, the group in London, they've got this thing called Alpha Fold, and they're, they're state-of-the-art work in doing structure. We're skipping structure completely and going directly from sequence to function and say, let the deep learning network figure it out. So and this is a case, and we did this uh, collaboration with Harvard. So what you're seeing is a picture of an AAV virus. And it's amazing. It's a, it's a complex of, I think, just like three proteins. And it just self-assembles into this soccer ball. It's incredible. And AAV viruses are currently one of the best vectors for doing gene therapy because they can sort of deliver the, the gene, but it does not integrate into your, into your genome. So you can sort of get a temporary therapy. And if it doesn't work, it kind of uh, fades out. But the, the, the surface sort of fuzz on the AV virus impacts um, whether it's going to get taken up by the, you know, whether it's going to be attacked by the immune system and whether it'll be selectively uptaked into different tissue. So we started this project that said, can we basically in silico try out different sequences and sort of predict what better AV viruses will be? So the basic way the system works is now, you know, with the ability to print DNA, you can make a bunch of variants. You can sort of usually get them to express in bacteria. And then if you can develop an assay for them, you start getting positive and negatives about which ones worked on this assay or not. So it turns out that if you do the machine learning right and you've got fairly dense, you know, you've got a bunch of examples around a sequence, 
the precision of these models is really high. So if you haven't drifted too far away, these models will predict how well it will do against that assay. Like, for example, will this AV virus package? Now, it turns out that the precision is good, but the recall isn't very good. So if you go too far away in sequence space, you get kind of junk answers. So now the challenge has become, you know, sequence space is nearly infinite. It's almost a discrete optimization problem. This is where should we even look in sequence space to start doing experiments in order to generate more data to make better models to do sort of iterative evolution. And if you can do this against multiple assays, you can start optimizing different things. So this is like, again, we're on the, on the verge of some really, really interesting work about designing proteins, designing antibodies, designing peptide drugs. So the stuff works really well. And there's some papers, again, in that document that I linked. So in this case, what happens, we we're making AV viruses, and we were making single mutants and a couple of double mutants. And what we're able, and again, it's, it's basically it's an optimization problem. And what we're able to do is to say, you know, this is what the heart, the the um, vertical axis is whether or not the, you know, is the precision did the virus package, did it meet the assay, and the the horizontal axis is how many mutations we made. So th so the 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 dotted line is just sort of making random mutations, and you can see as we make multiple mutations, it it just it, you know it stops working. So we got absolutely tremendous lift in terms of you know the precision of predicting which ones are going to work. So this is just this is just beginning. We're just at the opening of this. So if you want to read more, I encourage you to go to the site or you know, lots of research to do. Here's my last one, is. Simulation plus learning. So you guys, um, you know, PDEs are, we kind of know the physics. And in general, you can do this sort of PDE simulations. And the physics are known, but it's quite complicated because it depends on the parameters. It depends on the data and the velocity and the heat at, at that point. But you know, PDEs are, are how things are done. And it's like how climate is modeled. But it turns out that in these sort of PDE calculations, if you have the grid size, the computational complexity goes up by like the fourth power which is why we have climate models that are still done at you know, kilometer scale, because there just not, isn't that much computation. Well, it turns out, not surprisingly, that there are repeated patterns in the world <laughs> over and over and over again. And these networks are really good at finding these patterns. We don't, you know, not any rules that we could ever write. So again, you know, with hurricanes, these patterns seem to repeat. So we had a project inside Google that was trying to do super resolution on images. So you know you watch those crime shows, and they're like, turn up the resolution of that image. And they take a fuzzy image, and suddenly you see the, the perpetrator, which is, of course, BS. But it, not completely. So it turns out that if you have like a you know, kind of a defocused, low resolution image of an eyebrow, there are only so many eyebrows. And you can train models on real images, basically saying, here's the low resolution, and let me train it to predict the high resolution. And it essentially is learning the patterns that you see in normal photographs. You know, in theory, right, every pixel could be any color. It's, you know, it's sort of computationally explosive, um, uh, combinatorially explosive. But the world isn't really that complicated. It's got repeating patterns again. So what you're seeing here is like, like but the bicubic uh, is, is basically how PDEs are done. This one, this third one, is a neural net sort of taking that image on the left and increasing the resolution of it. Again, you have to be careful because it looks good, but it might not be real. Like it could be just a, a hallucination. But the ability to like make low resolution photos look high resolution and appealing is, is here already. So we said, hey, can we apply this in a PDE context? So what you're seeing here is on the left is the actual numeric. So the blue line is we did very expensive simulations at like every small point. Like this is basically as accurate as we know how to get it. Hugely computationally explosive. And the orange is, the orange is what the lower resolution um, uh, computation on uh, Berger's equations are. And what you're seeing on the right is at one quarter the resolution on the left, you're seeing what the network is imputing. So again, we train the network on the higher, you know, we said, here's the low resolution, here's the high resolution, learn to predict the high resolution from the low resolution, and it works like amazingly well. So this is buying, you know, powers of, of you know, very large, ex almost exponential speed up in how quickly you can do some of these simulations. So here's you know, an example with advection, too, around the baseline method. So what's, what's really kind of exciting about these techniques is that um, 
you know, if you suddenly get orders of magnitude speed up in your simulation, first of all, we can do more accurate climate simulations, which we're pretty excited about. But, um, but you can also s almost start treating it like a, an inverse design problem where, OK, I've got this input, and I can run the physics and tell you what the output would get. What if you want a particular output? What inputs do you give? Like That's an overwhelming calculation now. But what you do with this network, the gradients of the network almost guide you as to what possible inputs. So we have interesting projects in nanophotonics and things like that. So we're, we're, we're entering into this world of inverse design. And there, there's a great class at Harvard uh, taught by uh, someone who works part time with our team, Michael Brenner, on inverse design problems. So it's a really cool area. So I, I'm sorry I'm running so late, but uh, I, th let me wrap up a little bit. So you know, a lot of this talk was about the promise, and I hope you leave here excited, the fact that you're here and you're still here on Friday night. Um, but there's a lot of peril, too. So you know, just simple rules. Try simple models first. You, like deep learning is really cool. You don't always need to use it as a hammer. You know, and it's kind of neat now that there's specialized hardware. Sometimes you know, overkilling it if you got specialized hardware. But try simple models first because the simple models might tell you something interesting where this big ball of numbers isn't. You know, it's going to be very opaque to you. Um, my office mate Patrick Riley has got a great paper in Nature: uh, Three Pitfalls to Avoid in Machine Learning. It's a great paper. It's sort of born of lots of lots of experience. You know, try to predict the things you shouldn't be able to predict is a good example. We, we work with a lot of people doing bio stuff and just things like experiment design. They're like, well, all our controls are in the right column of the plate. And it's like, well, that might have been nice when you were pipetting, and that made it easier to pipette. But the right column of the plate, you know, it's fed later than the left column. It's in a different spot in the incubator. We can see all those things. Like, we get bio data from people. The first thing we do is we run our image quality thing, and about a third of the images are crap. The next thing we do is we try to predict, you know, can we predict the, web, the batch always? Can we predict the row and the column in the plate? Often, and again, it, the data—it's not that the data is unusable, but these tools are so exquisitely sensitive now that you're seeing all that stuff. So be careful that you're not just, you know, predicting a batch or predicting a, the row and column. It's funny because we can even tell, like, if two operators were doing the experiment, people have different lab hands, and we can usually tell if there were two different operators which operator ran the experiment. And again, it's not doesn't mean the data is not usable, but be highly sensitive to that. And then again, just look at your data. Look at your data. Like that stuff about the out of focus images, these networks will gladly predict. You train them, they look beautiful. You put crap in them, they'll predict. I can get you a, a, a DR diagnosis on a picture of an airplane. It's like it's not very useful. So look at your data again and again and again. Invest in scaffolding, invest in tools. Like look at your data, please. So just a couple final observations. There's really great opportunities here, um, but you really have to think about about the, um, the people and the workflow. So for example, like, are you building something to help humans? Really think about how the humans are doing their work and where the operating point is and how you're going to help them. If you're building stuff that's automated, I'm really excited about the kinds of stuff we can do with screening. Um, and again, seeing things that haven't been seen before. Can we rewrite the books on pathology? Um, Data is a challenge, uh, you know, and people are very protective about their data, maybe overly so. There's a lot of effort. If you're doing bio stuff, look at the UK Biobank. There's a lot of resources. Google's publishing lots and lots of data sets. Um, but don't just assume that data is going to be available. But you know, spend some time on the data and really curate your test set. Like we recently, there's a great paper out. Again, I linked it where we learned PFAM. This is the the huge database of protein sequences, and you know, there's about 18,000 identified protein fam and about a million and a half sequences have been characterized by what family they're in. There's another like 55 million or so where they used HMMs, like the best thing. And we were able to learn it in a model. We're about to release this. It runs in your browser. Like it used to be a really slow database lookup. We're going to release this thing where you could just run it directly in your browser. It's incredible. Absolute state of the art. It gives you a probability distribution across all 18,000 families as to which family it's likely in. So. Um, you know, uh, just uh, you know, absolutely sort of incredible tools emerging. Um, so, uh, um, and again, I, I think I mentioned this about the correlations and causation, but it, but you know, there might be something there, but but look at the data, and again, be careful about confounding signals. So. Um,
you know, I often give this talk to sort of lay audiences, and one of the things that I'm really encouraging, like sort of the business people or, or even the scientists, is learn to ask the right questions about this stuff. You don't necessarily need to be an expert in deep learning. Like, you know, my team has that expertise, but even though what we're largely trying to do is apply it, but learn to ask good questions. It's incredibly powerful. And again, just basic questions like, you know, do, are, are there confounding factors? But really even think about the question you're trying to answer, like a, a very legitimate complaint about a lot of ML in healthcare is like, oh, it's really, you know, uh, uh, someone will find a bunch of data with a bunch of labels. Like, I'm going to build a model to predict those labels. Like, well, that's really cool, but that's not what doctors do. That's not what doctors care about. Like, okay, you know, again, as a student, maybe you need to get a publication, but like, think about the, the predictions that matter. Think about, like, what's the really the right question here? And that's an incredible, you know, I, I work with a lot of amazing people, and, you know, the, the more senior people have developed this ability to ask the right questions. So like in, in your careers, please focus on that. So I think I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>